Welcome to this video on reading Renaissance Greek. About a year ago, when I was reading through Amandus Polonus's Syntagma, a German Reformed author, in the first synopses, which was a summary of the first chapter of the first book, in the first synopses, Polonus had quoted Aristotle, quoting from the categories. The word he had used there, which was the word for a homonym, looked apparent to me, and I could decipher it, but there was an aspect of the word that seemed to be almost cursive, and I had to guess what the letters were. Later, in the same section, he went on to quote Aristotle from his um, commentary on the proper method of teaching. So Aristotle says the proper method for teaching is discussing the names of things and then the things that they signify. Well, there were some words here that I definitely could read, because at the time I was taking a Greek intensive, I knew how to read Greek, at least, but there were forms that were totally unfamiliar to me, cursive and swervy. This was Renaissance Greek, or Greek with ligatures. This led me to wanting to find out how to actually read this, because it was stopping me in my study. I had reached out to a professor, had scoured online, and eventually found what are known as ligature charts, tools to decipher this kind of Greek. There was an issue though. I had realized there are other people who are probably in my position, those who may know Greek or not know Greek at all, and want to read these texts, but when Greek appears in this form, instead of it being something that enriches their study or their reading or their transcription, it actually is a stumbling block to them. This had led me to continue my work and transcription trying to type out the standard lettering for all these unique Greek forms in my own time. And then I thought, maybe I'll make a book. Maybe I'll offer examples and exercises, look at these old charts and present something to help people. But this video is the result of all that, other considerations being distilled here. I want to provide all those resources to you in an introductory way for your betterment. Now, discussing the goal more narrowly of this video for reading Renaissance Greek, it is to bridge the gap between the scholarly and the lay for theological and philosophical works. It's that simple. There are people who want to study theology, although not formally, and they want to read these texts. This Greek that appears, which you can see in the pictures on the right, stops them from doing so. So how do we do that? How do we bridge the gap, as it were? By making this known. This is done by the accessibility of information. The way that we demystify these high and lofty concepts, at least as they appear so, is by just explaining them simply. So, following the advice of Aristotle, let's first discuss the names of things and then the things that they signify. A ligature is just some kind of typographical convention to shorten letters or words. And there are two types of ligatures, a tie and a contraction. A tie is when words are joined together by a stroke or swoop, but they mostly retain their form. The letters can still be discerned, for the most part at least. A contraction is when letters or a word come to form a new form that can't really show any of the letters that are in it. An example of tie ligatures in English or Latin would be like a and E, S and T, F and I, or music sheets, Fs and Ps, will sometimes be ligatured. The majority of ligatures in Greek are going to be ties, so this should be a relief to you. Ties are easier to read. However, it is the case that sometimes ties are not intuitive. Sometimes a tie may appear a certain way. Um, it may look like a certain letter is coming out, but I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll discuss those when we get to that. So. A little bit of history also for you. Why does this happen? Where does this kind of unique Greek come from? Because in our books, when we see Greek printed as a very standardized, normal way of looking, well, with the influence of the Renaissance, humanism, and a general appreciation for the classical world, this leads to a resurgence of Greek within printing. The rediscovery of Greek text in Europe leads printers to want to reprint and publish these Greek texts. But of course, they have to have the types, right, the actual keys for the printing, for these Greek characters. So what do they use as a base? They're going to use the scribal fonts and tendencies of what they find in these rediscovered Greek texts. 
So minuscule and majuscule ways of writing Greek. And that's just to say min minuscule, lowercase, majuscule or uncial as uppercase. The bottom right picture, which is a work from uh, 1475, shows you that more simplified way of writing Greek type, or writing Greek in those simpler types. But near the end of the 15th century, an Italian humanist, Aldus Manutius, introduces the characters you're seeing on the top right picture, a much more eloquent and beautiful way of writing Greek that was very similar to what we know as shorthand-esque ways of writing. These types that he makes for his printer are hugely influential and lead to an influx of these kind of Greek types being used all over Europe. Of course, after the 1700s, so in the 1800s, right, at the turn of the 19th century, the use of ligatures drastically uh, decreases. And, and why is that? It becomes too tedious to maintain all of the different forms for a ligature. When you have a printing press and you have individual types to print a letter or a word onto a page, it got to the point that these ligatures were so vast and so many and so complicated, it became too difficult to keep up with them, and also the quality of printing decreased with these more particular and very precise forms. So these are eventually abandoned for more standardized typing, which you and I are more familiar with. Now, to the meat and potatoes of the video, how do you actually read a ligature chart? Well, before we go to how to read it, we need to talk about the history a little bit more. But these charts were printed with the actual printers, not any of the grammars. Now, eventually, these kind of charts are printed with Greek grammars. But a printer, to assist the reader in reading a work that contained ligatures, would publish a Greek alphabet book. It would have the letters of Greek pronunciation, consonant and vowel combinations, etc., and then ligatures. And these ligatures would be within examples. So you'd have the Song of Mary, the Song of Zacharias, the Ten Commandments, the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer. These kind of things were very common, and you would see ligatures appearing in them. Now, to how um, or how to read these charts is very simple. On the left, you have the actual ligature forms, and on the right, you have the standard lettering. So what the form is signifying. Here, I've typed out some examples, right? We appear to have a X, an L, and a W, or if we're looking at this in Greek, a chi, maybe a yota, and an omega. But that's not what this is. This ligature is chain. Below that, cha, chai, up, uper, and upa. So, on the left side, ligature form. When you're reading a text, this is what you'll see. On the right, the standard lettering, how you are to transcribe or read the ligature. Seems pretty straightforward. A note of caution. Sometimes the standard lettering will itself contain very common ligatures. So, sigma and tau, eta and nu, Omicron and Upsilon, Omicron and Nu, etc. These very frequent letter combinations will sometimes appear within the standard lettering on the right as a ligature. And I'll show you an example of that now. Look at the first example with SD. Here we can see the form for SD and then its standard lettering. Now, if you're reading this and you're not careful, you may think this is saying SE. Well, this is not SE, and how can we know that? Even if we don't know the form, we know this can't be SE because a sigma in Greek has a first form and second form. A first form sigma, or lowercase sigma, right? Uh, both of these are lowercase, will appear at the beginning or, the, or, the, or in the middle of a word. A second form sigma will appear on the end of a word. Again, so even if we were confused about what this was saying, it couldn't be SE. It has to be SD because this is a sigma tau ligature appearing in between the epsilon and the iota. Also, for the negative particle ook, you can see in the standard lettering on the right, the omicron and upsilon appear as a ligature. Keep that in mind. Also, with common things like T's or G's or tau's or gamma's with tos, tau, and tautha, this lengthened tau form 
could be confused to be a capital tau or a capital gamma. Neither of those are appearing here. This is just a way to write a tau that has a very lengthened look to itself. So the correct way to transcribe this standard lettering or these ligatures is going to be toss tau and tau tha with a lowercase t. Be sure that you're not confusing this with a capital T or capital gamma because they do look very similar. Also, I've mentioned and kind of have harked on the importance of reading things carefully here. I've already mentioned not trying to intuitively guess what letters are in a ligature. Here, subtle distinctions and forms is what we'll be looking at now. In the row on the left, we have some ligatures, gel, gel, gin, etc. What do you notice about these first three forms? They are very, very similar. Now, the first two examples, the only difference is in the presence of one more lambda or one more L. So that's not too big of a deal. But it is important because that could be a different word or it's the wrong word, right? It's incorrectly transcribed. Below that, though, we have gen. This is an entirely new set of characters. It's not just a difference in lambda, it's the presence of new. Now, how do you distinguish these things? They look so similar. Well, I'm going to give you three tips to how to distinguish these very particular forms. Every form is particular. Some ligatures are only distinguished by one or two strokes. So how do you tell the difference between gel and gel? By the presence of that extra stroke. When you see ligatures in a work, there is a chart that has that particular form that will have the standardized lettering for it. You will never come across a ligature that is not explained in some chart. Now, let's say you're reading a text though, and it's kind of hard to see what the ligature is, either because the quality of the printing is faulty, right? There's something wrong with the actual print on the page, or the page is damaged. What do you do? For my second tip, I want you to look at and utilize other manuscripts to see if your transcription matches, or to see if one has a more clear Greek text than the other. In all my experience, in all my time trying to transcribe Greek, there has never been a time where I've not been able to transcribe a form correctly, either by consulting a chart or by looking at a different work where the form is more clear. And then thirdly and last, do not presume that certain letters are contained in a ligature. Double check everything. An example of this could be seen really with the right. So on the right, with the third and from the top, with goon, that looks like perhaps gamma omega or gamma yota. This is neither of those. This is gamma upsilon nu. While we're still talking about particular forms, sometimes in Greek you will see the existence of what appear to be two accent marks, either acute or grave, a circumflex, a swerve, a circle, a curve, whatever, next to or on top of a letter or set of letters. This is denoting the rest of the letters in that word. So here I have four examples: ton, to, and tice. Ton could be signified by a tau with two grob accent marks on top. Two could be shown with a tau and a circumflex over it. Tice, likewise, you can see. Also, let's say we have those two acute accent marks next to a word. What does that signify? Well, the way you'll see this in a ligature chart is the form, right? Whether it's a circle, a curve, or two dashes, whatever. You'll see the letters. It signifies, it'll show you the example and then transcribe it. So we have two dashes, which is a form for epsilon yota nu, ain, as in leg dash dash. So dash dash is ain, as in legain, thus legain. You can see. Don't confuse or presume you know what form is appearing. Again, double check everything. Now, I want to hark on the importance of correct transcription. Here, I'm showing you a wrong transcription. Now, I'm not going to tell you how this is wrong. I want you to see if you can guess on your own by just looking at the text on the right and the left. This is from Antonius Valeus's Compendium of 
Aristotelian ethics called back to the standard of Christian truth. So, you're reading this, and you go, okay, Elias is quoting Greek here, or he's using Greek, but no worries. I have a ligature chart on hand, and I look at upragion. I can tell that's a rho alpha ligature and the gamma iota ligature. Next, I can see upratain, and a double tau is appearing here with a lengthened tau. And then ain, I can see that's a eta iota ending. And then I go on, I can decipher ta agathon and ta telos and ta eschaton. Wonderful, right? If you've got the correct letters here, good job. You've used your chart correctly, and you've, uh, well, at least for the letters, you've correctly transcribed these words. But what's missing here? The accent and breathing marks. This is super important. In Greek, the retention of breathing marks and accent marks could be the difference between one word or another. Also, in Greek, accenting is affected by the word that appears next to it. So you need to, if you are wanting to transcribe properly, include accent marks and breathing marks. Now here we actually have something interesting. We have udaimonion, upragion, and then upratein. What is the issue with this text? Actually here, we see that the smooth breathing mark is appearing over the first vowel within the text for, this, for the diphthong. When in reality, if we have a diphthong, the breathing mark is going to go over the second letter. So for a word like autos, which is a pronoun, or like he, the smooth breathing mark goes over the upsilon, not the alpha. And so here, this printing is incorrect. It's supposed to be udamanion with the breathing mark over the upsilon, so on and so forth. By the way, if you don't know how to read Greek, you should have that down first and foremost. You should have knowledge of the alphabet, diphthongs, double consonants, how accenting works. Pick up any Greek grammar, and the first chapter or introduction will give you knowledge how to do this very well. Okay, let's continue. Here, right, I've put the emphasis on correct accenting and breathing marks, but I'm just showing you very common ligatures. See if you can see the pattern. Archeitu Evangelio, Iesu Christu Huiltu Theo. Os que graptai in tois prapetais, edu ego apostelo, ton angelon, mu pra prosopu, su hos catescuese, ten hodon su, improsten su. Fone baontas in te aremo, et toi masata ten hodan curiu, utheas, poeta tas tribus autu. Ooh, 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 that's the very common pattern here with the genitive ending. This is a section from the Gospel of Mark, by the way, chapter 1, verses 1, um, one to 3. I'm not going to go too in detail about this stuff, although I will mention one thing. At the end of verse 2, we see a very funky-looking C with our Omicron Upsilon ligature. What's happening there? That's a lunar sigma. It's just a fanciful way for putting the sigma. It's still just a sigma. So, pretty straightforward. Also here, I have a note from Amandus Polonus's Syntagma. This is chapter 4 on ectypal theology. Here he quotes John Damascene and Clement of Alexandria. Now, I'm not going to go in detail again. I'm just showing this so you can compare the transcription on the right and then the ligatures on, or the transcription on the left and the ligatures on the right. Okay, let's work through some examples. I think the best way to do this, to assist you in an introductory way, is by working through some text and then pointing out little things that you might come across. So let's look at that. First, with Erasmus's Enchiridion. I'm very proud of this slide. And um, if you've not read Erasmus's Enchiridion, read his Enchiridion, or the Handbook for the Militant Christian. It is one of the best works on the spiritual life I've read in a very long time, and it is very worthwhile. So, here we have the Greek text. I'll read it first. Agontai kai phorontai. Now, you may be wondering, well, wait a minute. I'm looking at the first verb, agontai. I can see it's a gamma 
tied to another letter, but I don't know what ligature this is. How do I know? This looks like a gamma yota. Well, it can't be a gamma yota. And why is that? The yota is way too curved, right? If this is supposed to be gamma yota, the yota should not be that curved. Okay, so it's not a gamma yota. Well, is it a gamma omicron? Well, it can't be a gamma omicron because it's not complete. It's not a complete circle. So what's happening here? This is actually just a printing error. We know this is gamma omicron because a common ending for verbs in Greek is ontai. Also, the second verb frontai tells us it's omicron new here. There's no agentai either. So in this instance, we would want to try and compare a different version of Erasmus's Enchiridion and see if the text matches. But here, let's just say we don't have a way to do that. This is how we would do that. We would see, okay, is there another verb that has a similar ending, or is there a word that has a similar ending that may tell us what this ending is for this word? Yes, it's a farontai. And also, ontai is a common ending. Also, we're going to know, is there any way it couldn't be a form that we might think it is? Yes, it can't be gamma yoda, because this part of the yoda, if it is one, is way too curved. And also, Finally, there are no other forms that look like this that are letters tied to gamma. So this is agontai, chi, parontai. Now, looking at the second word, you may think, what's up with all these weird symbols in the middle part of the screen? There are 10 forms for writing chi. And here we are seeing one of them. And you may think, 10 forms for writing chi, how am I ever going to remember that? You won't, admittedly. But you will begin to see the patterns and you'll eventually know them. Chi has a very unique look. Also a note, sometimes words in Greek are very close together. You don't want to confuse two words as being one word. So how do we know that this is not agontai chi? Well, first, there is no agontai chi in Greek. You don't have any Greek words that are formed that way. But the presence of that grave accent mark on the Ending yota tells us this is a new word. No Greek word is going to have more than one accent mark. So the presence of an accent mark or a new breathing mark, right? Not a breathing mark, but a new one, a second one, shows a new word is appearing. Okay. Now for the bottom portion, there's just one Greek word, pitharche or pitharche. The theta will have this appearance. It's just a little swirly. Uh, nothing more. The theta can appear in a ligature without having to appear with a, diff or, um, a, a letter tied to it. So that's straightforward. Now, going on to something with a bit more Greek, let's look at Philip Melanchthon's loci communes. Okay. Here, I'll read the text first. Ein kai hikatein kai mesti. First ligature, we see, what is that L with that W shape? We go to our chart. Okay, that's an ain. Ain kai hikatain kai mesti. A note, do not confuse ain for un. You can see how close and similar those forms look. Do not confuse the two. Again, do not try and guess what letters are appearing with any ligature. Double check everything. Also, for the third word, hikatain, you may say, okay, this is kind of hard to tell what accent mark is being used. Is this an acute accent mark on the first letter? Well, no, right? If you have a vowel at the beginning of a word, you're going to have a breathing mark, either rough or smooth. And here we can tell just a little bit. This actually is a rough breathing mark over the yota for hiccatane. If it was smooth, it would be curved in a different way. We also know that's an acute accent mark over the epsilon, and not a grav, because a grav goes in the different direction. You'll see here that actually ain appears twice in this sentence, and that's true. And it appears on the end of a word. A ligature can appear anywhere in a word. The beginning, the end, the middle, whatever, or it could be a standalone thing by itself, as it is for the first time it appears in this sentence. Below that, let's read this section from 1 Thessalonians. He's quoting from um, 1 Thessalonians 5. Lengthen is here, at least in part of this. 
Reading the Greek text, let's read it. Pontata, karatai, adia, leptos, prosukesta, in panti, eucharisteta. Okay. The first P here in pontata has a very interesting form. It appears to be a heart with a line over it, an upside down heart. That's just a very common way that the P will appear in ligatures. I should note also, of course, ligatures don't affect the meaning of a word. It only affects its form. Next, we see adia. Okay, adia. That is a delta iota ligature. Now, you can see that I've mentioned here, sometimes the tail on a delta can increase or decrease in size. So it could connect to the letter immediately, or it could go down a bit further. But this is still delta iota, adia. The next word that has a ligature, leptos, has a P and then lengthened tau ligature. Do not confuse this again from the earlier example of being a capital tau or a capital gamma. This is leptos, lowercase p, lowercase tau. The next four, prosukesta, we can see a sigma theta ligature. Now, if you're not careful, you may think that this is a omicron theta or an alpha theta. Do not guess what letters are there. Look at your charts. Find the form you see in a chart and then see the lettering for it. So this is uh, sigma theta. Asta. Nothing more, nothing less. Next we have in, right? The preposition in. In all things, pray, is what is being said here in the Greek. Um, we have the imperative form for eucharistata. In here, you can see, we find that form, we find our chart. Okay, this is epsilon nu. Do not forget the existence of the breathing mark. It's very subtle, but you can see that in in, there is a smooth breathing mark. Now here, it's appearing over the new in this printing, but you don't have a breathing mark over a new. You only have that over vowels and also a row. Okay, next we have two forms. We have an eta, that little H symbol, and then a sigma tau ligature for the verb eucharisteta. So you find an H, you think, an H, what is an H doing here? Go to a chart, okay, that's an eta. And then we see this sigma tau. Sometimes, as well for deltas and sigma taus, the little hook on the end or the tail could either go up or down some, but it is still just a sigma tau ligature. Okay. By the way, the reason why I've put a question mark here next to um, the last verb is because Melanchthon is saying he's quoting from 1 Thessalonians 5. And if you look at this section in 1 Thessalonians 5, in Ponte Eucharisteta, it's not Eucharisteta, it's Eucharisteta. It's an iota instead of an epsilon here. I'm not sure why it appears that way. Maybe Melanchthon is quoting something else that's similar, or he's just freestyling what the Greek is here. But in a TR text, it is a iota, not an eta. But we're transcribing what Melanchthon wrote, and he put an eta here. So that's what we're going to transcribe. Finally, I want to show you a section from Peter Canis's Catholic Catechism. Now, I've not chosen Peter here because he is a fan of mine, right? He's a Jesuit. I'm not a huge fan of Jesuits. But I think that this work is a great example to demonstrate ligatures. In a way, that's not too hard. Most of these examples I've chosen, I think, are good ways to introduce somebody to this topic. You will, of course, find ones that are more and more complex. But with study and exposure, they'll become easier. So let's look at this work. Here, I've not highlighted or noted in detail any of the ligatures. I've just transcribed all of this. So, here it is. Catechismos Catholicos. So, a Catholic catechism. Petru Canisio, tes tu Jesu etarias theologo. So, a Catholic catechism by or of Peter Canis of the Society of Jesus, a theologian. So, he's a theologian of the Society of Jesus. So he's a Jesuit theologian. That's what it's saying. And then, Kephalon, Proton, the first chapter, or the first head, but it's chapter here, most likely. 
Perites pistu eos, caetutes pistu eos, sumbado. So concerning, or on, and the way we would say, uh, in Latin it'd be de fide, like on the faith. So here it's perites pistu eos. Concerning, or on the faith, and caetutes pistu eos, sumbado. And on the symbol of the faith. The symbol of the faith is a common way to talk about the Apostles' Creed. Now, earlier I mentioned. Kai, the conjunction most usually translated as and, could have more than one form. It could have ten forms. Even within one text, you will see Kai take on different forms. So if you look at Kai as it appears in the phrase peri teis pistuos, kai tu teis pistuos, uh, pistuos symbolu, it has that interesting form there. But in the final part with Tina de Legestai Christianon Kai Catholicon, it has a different form. It's still Kai. It just has a different form. Now, at the end of this, I'm going to note this too for correct transcription, you need to include any punctuation present within the Greek text. So here, in the final section of this introduction, when it says Tina de Legestai Christianon Kai Catholicon, we see a semicolon. The existence of a semicolon in Greek shows a question is being asked. Now, from the context, if you're reading it or transcribing it, it'll be clear if a question is being asked. But for correct transcription, you need to note a semicolon because it denotes formally a question is being asked. And that is all I have for this video. Now, for those who have made it this far, let's offer a brief recap. We've gone over the history of ligatures, why they appear when they don't appear, tips for reading, transcription, and careful analyzation. If you are about to go into a text where you know you'll find Renaissance Greek or these Greek ligatures, I would encourage you, work through a chart at first, and then look at the text you're reading. If I had done that, I would have saved myself countless hours, and no doubt the same can be had for you. A lot of time saved. In the description of this video, I'll provide you some resources to read Ligature Greek and for its history. The two that I will provide will be the main ones that you'll be using for transcription. They are the most extensive, from what I can tell. And I will also offer a link to a blog post that I wrote about this matter as well. So, I pray that this introductory video enriches your study of ligature Greek. I hope it was easy to follow and track. This is my first time doing something like this in presentation form. But again, I think that it's laid out very clearly and very well for your benefit. So, until next time, see you.